Okay. All right, so you guys can see this now. Great. Okay, cool. So, um, so we're going to talk today about. Uh, so we we spoke. Let's see. Recently, we talked about um, volcanoes, volcanoes into um, uh, earthquakes, earthquakes into tsunamis, and now tsunamis playing into nuclear disasters. Um, uh, the tie-in, obviously, is the Fu Fukushima um, issue in 2011. In uh, in Japan, and the earthquake that in turn induced a tsunami, which in turn induced the the crisis at the Fukushima Fukushima Daiichi power plant that is that we're still dealing with, and we will be dealing with for several decades more, it, it seems um, in all likelihood. So, um, so that's the plan. So today we're going to talk about nuclear disasters. Now, this is the first uh, of the um, well, I suppose we talked about it in the context of, of Katrina and things of that nature in, in some of our hurricane discussions. Um, but really, this is the first topic that is, is pretty much um, essentially completely human created. It's essentially completely anthropogenic, anthropogenic in um, its creation, in its magnitude, in how the uh, uh, duration, magnitude, extent of the disaster and the impacts play out. So this is clearly something of our own making. So uh, before we go on, I'll just say that uh, uh, I want to start with this idea of black swans and gray rhinos. We touched on this a little teeny bit early, way, way, way back at the start of class. But but um, have you guys heard of this before or before, or before we mention it in this class or before we mention it here have, have you guys heard of this notion of black swan and gray rhino i have not now okay okay cool so um so black swan so this has become a um something that i've been reading about for a while but it seems to have really gotten really popular uh with covid uh since the onset of the covid 19 pandemic the idea is, so this is historically black swan were typically talked about by sort of financial people, people on Wall Street. Um, it, it first really got big play in I think the popular press in the with the 2007, 2008, uh, the Great Recession. And, and uh, the idea with the black swan event is something that couldn't possibly predict, had no idea it was gonna happen, just sort of came out of the blue and, and had a huge impact on things. So originally people talked about it as influencing financial markets, but now people talk about it more generally as just you know, influencing whatever the system that we're, we're speaking about is. And again, the idea is that normally we have swans and they're born and they're, they're white or they're white swans with black faces or you know, that kind of thing. And then every once in a while you get a, a completely pure black swan. So a very unusual um, occurrence is the idea. And um, this is sort of, uh, this never sat well with me. <laughs> I'll just say that, uh, lay all my cards on the table. Never sat well with me. Um, it seems to be a cop-out, quite frankly. Um, so, so to be sure, there's things that, that you guys aren't planning for or, 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 or aren't, aren't thinking is a likely event. Um, and then sometimes these things just happen. And so, so that, that's part of life, right? We're not all perfect. We don't foresee the future. But um, the idea of this black swan has gotten really popular. It's like when people talk about thinking outside the box, right? Which everybody says, because they say that because everybody else says they should say that. And so now everybody says, I have to think outside the box. They don't know what that means, but it sounds like they're, they're kind of being creative or something. Um, and the idea of this black swan um, uh, idea is that it seems to have fallen in that same that same sort of management speak kind of uh, uh, people are supposed to say this, but really it seems to me a cop out. So if we looked at the housing bubble, for example, that preceded the 2007 financial craziness um, and all the shenanigans to use a nice word for the um, market manipulations and incorrect valuation of, of home prices and all that kind of stuff, um, it, the notion that it was completely out of the blue and nobody had any idea, and this was just a surprise, um, not, not true, right? 
Um, it, it, it caught many of us by surprise when it actually happened, but it shouldn't have been. And so, so people have been a little ticked off at this for a while. And so a new term has come up in the last um, a few years, and that's sort of in response, playing off the idea of a black swan, but the, in, but, um, the idea is uh, something, let's take climate change, for example. Let's take, uh, today we're gonna talk about these uh, nu uh, nuclear disasters, power plant meltdowns, things of that nature. Is it really totally out of the blue? Is it really completely something we couldn't possibly have envisioned, had no idea this could possibly play out? Or is it something different? And so to be sure our nuclear power plants are not melting down every single uh, day. Our financial markets aren't imploding every single day. So clearly these events are rare, thankfully, but the notion that they are completely out of the blue and we had no idea, nobody could have predicted them, that's not exactly right. So the idea here is a gray rhino. So something, let's say we're on a, um, on a track or, or out in, in uh, you know, the African savannas or forests or wherever, and we're cruising around. Um, we might want to know if there's rhino around us, right? Now, hopefully we've set up our camp safely. Um, you know, unfortunately, many, most rhinos are now critically endangered. So there aren't a thousand million of them, you know, stepping across the landscape every single minute of the day. So, you know, we'll take some precautions, try to, try to, uh, either have a guard up around our camp, have some, some devices and some structures that would discourage rhinos from coming into camp, et cetera. But the notion to say that there was no possibility, we had no idea that this rhinoceros could possibly cause damage isn't correct. Also, the choice of rhinoceros is very specific. So whereas a swan is a pretty thing, it's a, it's a nice little bird and it, it, it flies around, maybe it poops on you, but that's about, you know, the most dangerous kind of thing maybe a swan would do maybe nip you a little bit with, his, with its beak but a rhino a rhino coming through can kill you right a rhino is a serious threat unusual but when it does come through say your camp you you got to pay attention or you're going to be hurt and so the idea um, of a gray rhino instead of the, the black swan type of an event is the idea of something that again originally proposed in the context of economic uh, 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 activities, but it can apply to any type of, a, of a event, any type of system. Um, and the point is that that, that risk um, is something that we choose to not prepare for, but, that, but it's still there. And so, so these rare events are perhaps better described as gray rhinos. And so when we go through talking about some of these nuclear disasters today, I'd like you to keep that idea in mind, this idea of a, of a gray rhino type of an event. And climate change seems to be a perfect example of um, a gray rhino. So simply saying it, 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 we couldn't possibly envision all these bad things is not being honest and is not being uh, intellectually robust. Another uh, theme that I wanna have you guys keep in your head as we talk about this stuff today is this notion of um, feature or bug. Uh, there is sort of a notion that oh man uh, well we didn't we didn't program our we didn't program the 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 iPhone app exactly correctly and so unfortunately there's a bug that's in there so sorry that it it took some of your information or sorry that it passed on your your geolocation you know that was that was a bug um, is it a bug sometimes it's a bug but is it really a bug or is it a, is it more a designed aspect of the system. Is the system set up from the get-go to be more likely to say share your um, information? So, so so in inculcated have we been to our our smartphone technology is we all think apps are a thing, right? Apps were apps. Fifteen years ago, there was no such thing as apps, right? So apps were invented to turn you into a commodity. So apps were invented to get money from you and to take more of your personal information. So if you think about it, these phones are really cool, incredibly powerful devices, sensors, cameras, all that kind of fantastic stuff. But all the things we do with our apps, listen to music, uh, uh, play a game, um, um, check the weather, whatever the case may be, 
every single one of those could be done on the web. If you think about it. Why do I have a, a streaming service app? Why do I have a, a whatever app, right? Pretty much everything um, with the possible exception of recording your voice and snapping a picture um, can be done through a web interface. So why is it that we're, we have these, this app store on, on, um, the, on the iOS or the Google Play Store or, or any of these different services? It's an economy that's invented. And so, so when we have problems with this system, is that really a bug or is that more a designed feature? We can talk about social media. We can talk about all these aspects of things. And so as we go forward today and talk about um, some of the challenges that we're facing with regards to uh, nuclear accidents, nuclear releases and things of that nature, um, I, would, I, I wouldn't say that people are designing these systems to release radiation into the environment. That's not, that's not a, I think, a, a fair statement. But, but has the system been rigorously designed um, uh, with safety in mind, with um, fail-safe structures in mind and all this kind of stuff to avoid uh, releasing radiation to the environment? Um, or has the system set up to um, uh, be more likely to do that? Does that make sense? Questions so far? Okay. So a little bit of just uh, context, since this is, um, this is a little bit different than some of our other disasters that we've talked about um, in our class so far. Just wanna go over a couple basic things, make sure we're on the same page. Uh, so, so this notion of pollution and ecotoxicology, when we talk about radiation releases or nuclear contamination uh, from, from a nuclear accident, that kind of stuff, um, we're talking about pollution by and large. Um, so uh, the idea of pollution is some introduced uh, uh, thing, material, energy, that we don't want, that's undesirable, and causes some adverse change to the system. So that's what pollution is, right? Something we don't want. Um, ecotoxicology, we're not going to, not, this isn't our ecotoxicology class or our coastal contaminants class, uh, but at least at, at the um, approaching this level or framing it for us, um, we're, we're interested in ecotoxicology. To ecotoxicology is a relatively new uh, branch, a relatively new uh, offshoot of the field of toxicology. Toxicology was invented to study poisons originally. It was invented to deal with um, um, essentially all, the, all these aristocrats in Europe. They all married each other and they're sisters and brothers and cousins and whatever, and they were all inbred and they had all kinds of health problems and there was all kinds of kids. And so it was hard to become king or queen, right? So poisoning became a very popular um, uh, a tool to get power and to move up in the ranks. And so when people started using poisoning more, um, the, the um, investigators had to learn, understand poisons. And so we started studying them and it was very much sort of a dark art. And then in the late 1800s, early 1900s, in the city of New York, some scientists began to apply um, uh, modern um, hypothesis testing, et cetera, to this field of poisonings um, and essentially invented the modern field of toxicology. Fla fast forward to uh, the late 60s, early 70s, into the 80s, and people started saying, hey, you know, it's not just about human poisoning, it's poisoning humans, of course, but also the rest of the environment. And so that field is known as, is now known as ecotoxicology. And so that's where we were looking at the poisoning or, or the toxic exposure of organisms, populations, communities, ecosystems, and, um, and, and a range of substances that, that can cause problems and, and energy sources. Um, for clarity, when we talk about toxicity or problems from um, exposure, we're talking about uh, changing something. So we're talking about halting a process, slowing down a process, or in some cases, speeding up a process that's some essential function of the organism. That could be a physiological process, that could be a behavioral process, um, uh, and, and we can break that toxicity down to a, a few different very, this is, this is, this is, Dr. A's ecotoxicology 
uh, 101 in one slide kind of things. So this is super fast, but, but we can break that toxicity down into um, what we might call everyday me metabolism, the kind of stuff like growing hair and, and, uh, and that kind of stuff, um, or, or toxicity that manifests as a mutagenic or carcinogenic um, process or, or um, interaction. Uh, to, uh, and, and or something that 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 is toxic and causes negative influences to embryos and developing organisms or developing life history stages, and or uh, something that could impact your reproductive output. So affect your your gametes, um, affect your ability to again could be physiological, could be behavioral, could manifest in different ways. But toxicity can play out in a whole variety of ways, even though we sometimes traditionally or when we read the newspapers and people talk about radiation poisoning or whatever, we sometimes think of a relatively narrow um, array of, of outcomes or possible toxicity. Okay. Um, traditional toxicity or, or toxicology, excuse me, is very much so grounded in the so-called dose response theory. And so that says, with a given level of um, exposure, or if we're talking about ingesting, we could talk about dosing. So taking in a certain volume, <clears throat> say, of liquid. So as we take some amount of that substance into our body or, or, or we're exposed to it, um, we see some effect or so-called response. And uh, substances are different. The systems are different. But we can imagine a whole variety of potential response curves. So in some cases, if we take number A here, which is a very basic linear response, I give myself, uh, you know, twice the amount of, or so, so I, I get exposed to the substance and I feel sick to my stomach. I take twice as much of that substance and I feel twice as sick um, and so on and so forth. We could have something like the response B, which is we have, um, exposure a little bit, not much is happening, a little bit more, not much is happening until we hit some type of threshold. But then once we get beyond that, uh, that level, and maybe we have some physiological mechanism where our body, uh, or it could be a behavioral response where we um, are able to avoid any negative consequences from a little bit of exposure. But then once it gets to a certain level, we, we, we can no longer do that. And we start to suffer the negative consequences. And then uh, all the other possible things. So in some cases, you could see um, uh, very uh, uh, strong response at low dose. And as we go a little bit higher, maybe the, the downsides actually decrease potentially and, and so on and so forth. So this notion of dose response theory is really, really key. Um, and some substances we um, can be exposed to depending on how the dose response curve looks, uh, looks um, we might be exposed and have no impact, at least at, at, at low level of exposure, no problem. Um, yeah, I'll say that. And then we have some substances that, that even very, very, very small amounts, um, we see, we see uh, consequences, even at like the parts per billion or sometimes parts per trillion uh, level of concentration, we can see negative impacts. So things like that include lead. So any amount of lead, ingesting lead is, 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 uh, causes bad things for us, um, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so we're talking about nuclear disasters here. So also by way of, of introduction, we're going to want to just touch on, um, you guys have all had this before or seen this before in previous classes, but it might've been a while. So we'll just touch on this again, very briefly. Um, so ionizing radiation, we're talking about the sort of higher energy span of electromagnetic radiation. Um, these get from this category of radiation, we can get outright burns. We can be, get cooked, you know, our skin, let's say could be cooked. It can absolutely impact our physiology right now. It can also induce genetic mutations and whack our, our genome. The sources of ionizing radiation can basically be broken down into two basic areas. So one is just the stuff that's around here all the time. My computer is on right now. I'm in front of my computer. Um, I'm on. I'm underneath my roof, 
And if I step outside, I'll be more in the straight sunlight and I'll be getting even more um, uh, radiation coming down on me. If I were to move to, uh, well, if I were to move to Denver, Colorado, I would basically be, for, compared to where we are here at sea level in California, I would be basically doubling my uh, background radiation exposure and for a given year. Uh, if I took a job as a uh, airline pilot or as a airline uh, host or hostess or steward or stewardess, I, I can't remember. I always get, I say the, the the incorrect, sorry, the politically incorrect term, whatever that is. But but the wonderful folks that help us have our flights whenever we get to go back to being on planes again. Um, those folks, because the airplanes themselves fly so high um, and just about their normal thing, walking about the cabin and, and stuff or sitting in the pilot seat, uh, they have a, a much increased level of exposure to the background levels of radiation coming from outer space, et cetera. Um, and then we, we could also have, I should also note that we can also have, there's natural sources of radiation. So that comes from things like uh, radioactive deposits in uh, sediments, et cetera. So we could maybe have a, a, um, a radioactive ore around us. A, a classic one we would have in um, California would be things like we have a lot of granite and one of the um, uh, products that can come off of granite from some of the, the um, nuclear processes is radon gas. And historically we lived in pretty windy houses and not super, super um, contained houses, but starting in the seventies when we got really worried about energy efficiency and energy conservation, and we started doing a much better job of sealing our windows, sealing our doors. Um, in some cases, uh, we, we don't typically seal our floors, right? Because we're worried about wind blowing in or, or smoke from a wildfire blowing in. We're usually not worried about the ground. Uh, and so radon gas, in some cases, could, could be building up in people's houses. And so is that deadly? No, but that could increase our background exposure to radiation. So the background stuff, and then we have all of the, the increased exposures that we create as a species, the anthropogenic sources. So this is going to the dentist to get an x-ray. This is uh, releases from nuclear power plants, weapons fall out, uh, the operation of our uh, television in front of us, all those types of things. Um, we ourselves expose, uh, burning of coal is a huge source. So um, we burn so much coal on this planet, we're increasing our exposure to radiation uh, that way um, from taking the sub this substances down uh, from underground and combusting them and turning them into particulate matter. Uh, so, um, so, right, so the ionizing radiation that we're most worried about here are things like gamma rays, x-rays, that type of stuff. And when we talk about uh, nuclear accidents, say a, uh, a power plant leaking, um, we have a, a, a range of different types of radiation, alpha, beta, um, et cetera. Um, uh, so these different types of radiation, different substances have different penetration and have different uh, 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 potential impacts on our bodies or on the natural world if we were to have a release. Um, and so, so we're not, again, we're not, we're not doing a nuclear chemistry lecture per se, but just wanted to touch on that and make sure that we're all on the same page there. Another key, key aspect of this when we have these discussions is the idea of half-life. So what, what, what does half-life mean? Half-life, again, is the notion that if we had a thousand molecules of whatever, plutonium-239, let's say, uh, if we had a thousand molecule, if we had a thousand atoms of plutonium, it would take 24,000 years for us to have 500 uh, uh, atoms of plutonium in our, in our magic bag. And if we wanted to take that down to 250, uh, we would have to wait another 24,000 years, okay? And so, so this is, this is uh, radioactive decay. So this is a natural process. Um, and obviously some things like iodine uh, have a very fast decay rate. So they're decaying, um, you know, within um, a very short period. And if we did have a, a nuclear accident, for example, that's something that if we could um, sequester ourselves away from those materials and wait the 
certain number of days. So maybe wait a couple couple rounds of, of half-lives. So in the case of iodine, maybe wait 16 days. We're gonna have one fourth the exposure um, as uh, that we would if, if we were to walk out into that environment and on day one. But obviously other things have a much longer uh, uh, time span of half-life. Um, okay, so, oh, half-lives. I shouldn't say half-lives, that should say, uh, I should have deleted that title. Um, okay, so uh, so there we are. So, that, so that's by way of introduction. Now I want to start talking about our, our power production so that we are, we're all on the same page. But is that is that good so far? Any questions so far, you guys? They should all be review anyway. Okay, cool. All right, so um, where are we right now? So we're, we're, we're specifically talking about nuclear power today. And um, we've we've had a, a, a pretty, um, pretty significant uh, relative drop off here compared to the other components in our uh, energy mix and our in our global energy mix and in our American energy mix. Now, this is this is data for averaging across the whole country. And so clearly in some areas there is more of a particular or, or like so Pacific Northwest has a lot of hydro, for example, right? Um, uh, East Coast tends the Midwest tends to have a, have more coal. Um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, Texas has a lot of an increasingly large amount of wind and, and on, on and on. So, um, but this is where we are. So with, with nuclear power, so right now you can see, obviously we're still heavily reliant on fossil fuels, right? So, and just to be clear, fossil fuels are every, the, the top three uh, columns on the right-hand side. And if we add that up, we're talking about, you know, about 80% of our total energy mix um, is, uh, for, for the, the country as a whole, comes from some form of uh, non-renewable fossil fuel. Uh, nuclear is right now, this is, well, this is, this, I, I grabbed this data off the um, uh, Energy Information Administration website uh, very early this morning when I was pulling this talk together. Um, and so this is the most recent they have on their website. And so uh, uh, we will probably soon have 2020 data. It takes them a little while to, to um, sort of QA, QC all the data sets, but, but this is the, our, our most recent as of right now. And um, we're talking about 8% of our energy is coming from nuclear power plants. So here's the trajectory that we've been on in terms of uh, our country, starting with the, the independence from Britain. Initially, mostly biomass, right? So we're chopping down trees, we're burning trees. Uh, wood is our primary source, and that lasts for a long time. That lasts up until the um, very late 1800s, where coal starts to take over in the Industrial Revolution, and then coal sort of really spikes up until we start uh, drilling for oil, and then oil takes over, and oil uh, becomes king and has remained king. Nuclear really doesn't get going until a couple decades after World War II. Obviously, we invent the nuclear bomb um, in World War II, fear of fascist regimes that, that we thought were developing uh, or, or had feared that were developing this, this catastrophic weapon, so we raced to use this technology initially as a, as a weapon of war. And then only later did we try to harness it for uh, uh, less aggressive purposes, meaning um, uh, power plants. And so, so that really gets going in the 60s and then takes a while to get things planned and approved. So really 70s is when um, nuclear power starts to take off. And we're gonna return to this, um, this trajectory a bit later, but, um, but there we go. So that, that's our current picture for uh, energy consumption in the U.S. Um, so this is this is where we are now. So uh, nuclear power for our grid um, actually peaked in 2012. So peaked almost a decade ago with a bit over 100,000 megawatts of production all told when you add up all the reactors. And uh, at that point, a decade ago, we had 104 operating nuclear reactors. By the end of 2020, um, so this past year, 
uh, we only had 94 operating reactors in the US. Um, uh, but nevertheless, the, the generate, and I don't know what that, oh, I, this, is, this is what happens when I write these lectures super early in the morning, I apologize. So I don't know what the O is there. It was supposed to be approximately 96,000. So we've held pretty close to about the same amount of output, right? Even though we've gone down by 10 uh, reactors. So that tells us we're being more efficient with our power generation from these from from this nuclear energy source which is a good thing right if we're if we're going to be burning coal if we're going to be burning whatever if we're going to be erecting a windmill we for all the downsides of the windmill the the nuclear plant the dam whatever we want to make sure that at least we're getting as you know we're squeezing every drop of usable energy out of that for um for the downside and so we're, we're getting uh, we've gotten better at that over the past a decade in aggregate in the US. Okay, so let's focus in on uh, nuclear uh, energy right now. Um, so here we go. So this is a, a, time, a time on the x-axis. On the left axis in blue, that's capacity. So that's uh, how, how much we um, uh, could be producing. Generation is how much we actually are generating. Um, and so, so capacity is how many uh, you know working units basically we have, and then the the gold on the right axis is how much we're pumping out. And what we see is so the doesn't matter which which line we're looking at, but what I want you to focus on is initially in the '60s we start and it's going up pretty steep, right? It's going up at a at a pretty even clip. It's a pretty solid trajectory, and then and then around um, the the 80, well, there's a, there's a bump that happens in the late 70s, or excuse me, a, a dip that happens in the late 70s. And then it kind of goes down for a bit and then it kind of recovers and then goes, and then it it plateaus in the in the mid 80s. Any guesses right now as to what's what's uh, what, what, what's driving that or, or what might explain these overall broad patterns in terms of terms of uh, uh, US nuclear energy generation? No guesses. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Maybe you guys are talking again in my, my audio thing. So try again. If people are talking, try again. Why is it not let me? Why does it say? So it says somebody's talking, but try again. Sabrina or somebody, were you guys talking? I don't. Have a guess. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Sometimes when I start my thing, it it mutes you guys for some reason. So I, I uh, thought I thought somebody was talking. I didn't mean to didn't mean to call you out. I just thought I saw you talking. So okay, okay. So no guesses. Okay, so nobody has a guess then. That's all good. That's all good. Let's let's investigate as we go forward. Okay, cool. Okay. Um. This is one of the crazy things. I, this is perhaps one of the most crazy things um, when it comes to um, having these discussions of power and energy supply, to me at least. It's the idea that um, essentially what we're doing with this incredible space age thing, right? The, 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 the power of stars and, and all this amazing um, science and physics and understanding and, and engineering that's gone into these power plants, all we're doing is boiling water. Super crazy. You can use nuclear power in different ways, but the modern commercial industrial uh, uh, nuclear power plants do not use any of the sort of science fiction-y crazy um, uh, ways of generating electricity. Some of our deep space probes, some of our space probes going to places like um, a Saturn and, and places like that, we actually um, do use some different ways of taking a, a, a nuclear, a, a reactive pile um, in the spaceship and using that to generate heat and, and electricity directly. But with the exception of those very strange, uh, unusual settings, when we have a power plant, all we're doing is boiling water. And so we're using this uh, um, ranking process, 
which is the same thing we, we do when we burn coal. It's the same thing we do when we burn uh, wood. It's the same thing um, when we do just about any traditional turbine type of um, uh, power plant, which is the vast majority of our power plants. And so the idea is this, we're gonna create some heat. With that heat, we're gonna boil some water. In theory, you could be boiling other substances, but virtually everybody boils water. Uh, and then that, that liquid water gets converted into steam. That steam uh, goes through a turbine and the, the hot air, the air moving, um, or, or, or the, the steam, excuse me, moving uh, uh, spins blades and those blades turning uh, uh, generate a magnetic field and that magnetic field induces a current in, in some copper wire and then therefore we have electricity. Um, we do have other ways of generating electricity. So solar does not operate this way. Solar is, is essentially taking those silicon cells and allowing the, pho or the photons are smacking that, that crystalline surface and free, basically freeing up some electrons directly. And those electrons start moving through the circuit. Uh, with wind, we are doing, we're spinning the turbine, but we're spinning the turbine directly by blowing on it. Same thing with hydroelectric, we're spinning the turbine directly with, the, with gravity, um, pu pulling water over those blades. And then we have something called ocean thermal energy conversion. Uh, we have some plants in uh, Israel and in the Middle East, places like Saudi Arabia. And we have some experimental plants in Hawaii um, that essentially take different temperature water. So water from, um, uh, in Hawaii, it, it's surface water, so ocean, oceanic surface water. And then they pump water from several hundred feet down, much colder. And they use a non-water, they'll use, I can't remember what they're using. They're using a, some kind of ethanol or something. I can't remember what, what the substance is, but, but basically they use that, that relatively small temperature difference to turn that, that liquid into its gaseous state. And then that in turn turns the turbine. So we do have other ways of producing power, but uh, nuclear is using the old school technology that we've had for well over a hundred years. Um, uh, to generate electricity. Um, and this is basically all it is, super fancy. Uh, we're gonna create some heat. And so all we need is heat and that heat can come from a variety of, of sources. Most commonly it's petrochemical, um, but in the case of nuclear, it's the heat from the, the radioactive decay and interactions that in turn boils water uh, through a series of uh, heat exchangers and that water then moves through the turbine. That turbine spins, again, uh, uh, spins those copper wires and induces a current in other copper wires through the magnetic field, the alternating magnetic field, and then we have our power. So um, before, let's see, it was during the Woolsey fire, when the Woolsey fire happened, um, I always seem to be gone when we have these fires. So uh, um, we were just having a discussion with this in my family. Uh, last week uh and how i was uh I so my coastal class i normally take everybody on a, a couple field trips or a lot of field trips and this was actually one we were down at this um pretty amazing uh gas turbine plant in san diego uh when the woolsey fire was essentially breaking out and my family was evacuating the, ha the house and i was i was um walking through a power plant with uh, or a manufacturing plant with our students and then just as last week, I was up dealing with some family health stuff. And uh, then the, the fires popped up in, in uh, Westlake Village. And I got a call, like, oh my God, you're always away whenever these fires happen. So anyway, but, but, but Gat, in this case, uh, this company in um, San Diego makes ultra efficient uh, gas turbines. What does that mean? That means about 40% conversion efficiency in terms of these uh, very high end. So these, these are turbines that would go on a cruise ship. These are turbines that would go in like sort of a backup generator for a university campus type of thing, or maybe a, um, a manufacturing plant. So these are very, very large capacity. Um, uh, basically, this is a little jet engine uh, bolted to your uh, floor of your building. 
Okay, and then once that turbine is spinning, then it turns the generator and the generator is the thing that actually induces the current and, and gets the electricity going through the wires. Okay, so where do we get the heat from? Where do we get the heat for, for these, all these nuclear um, power plants? We get them from um, uh, unstable isotopes. And so uh, uranium, plutonium, et cetera. And uh, these, these um, uh, sources interact with each other and get hotter and hotter and induce warmth. And that warmth then is in, used to boil water. We control the, the reaction, the fission. And this is not fusion, this is fission, remember. This is the one where we're breaking apart things or, or things are falling apart. Um, fusion is when we're merging stuff together. In this case, we're, we're breaking stuff apart and we control that importantly with some type of medium. So we're controlling that by putting something in between the different chunks of radioactive material that will inhibit the, um, the induction of, of radioactive decay and fission. Uh, yeah, okay, we don't care about this. This is too much. Okay, so there we go. So, this, so that's background. Now let's get into what's actually happening with these, these power plants. Questions so far? Again, that should all be review for everybody. Okay. Okay, so here we go. So, um, so really, our history, as I mentioned before, our, our history with nuclear power is really a, a born of war and born born of outright war and born of the Cold War. The the um, competition between the West, the America slash the Western, the NATO powers and the Soviet bloc. So we first figure out. Uh, that, that nuclear fission is a real thing. We demonstrate it uh, in a, a giant um, uh, uh, pile uh, in, in Chicago. And um, uh, that starts in 39. We have the first controlled nuclear chain reaction in 42. And uh, we immediately then turn our attention to making um, the atomic bomb. And we test that in. New Mexico, and then uh, go and uh, bomb the Japanese to end the, um, uh, bring about the surrender of Imperial Japan and the end of the, well, uh, end of World War II. Um, but pretty soon after that, right, so within six years of, of setting off the first bomb, we're actually generating electricity from the first experimental reactor in Idaho. And so we're starting to figure out how can we use this to not just blow stuff up, but in a much more controlled manner um, and, and at the level of, of, of heat that we want. And um, so then we rapidly progress through the 50s with different experiments and different uh, technologies um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, by the time we get to the late 60s, early 70s, there's this huge interest in nuclear power. So the phrase back then is um, uh, cheap, uh, clean, or, or, or clean, uh, what is it? Uh, oh, safe, clean, too cheap to meter. So the idea was in the 50s, people would talk about, oh, we're going to have all these nuclear power plants all over the place, and it's going to be producing electricity so cheap that nobody will pay for it. It'll basically be, you know, a hundredth of a penny of a per kilowatt or whatever the, the thought was, right? We, we never make that overly rosy prediction come to pass, but that was what the talk was, right? This is also the era of very much so uh, different from now, but where most of society really had a huge amount of faith in technology, a huge amount of faith in science, and mostly science was giving things to people. Hey, here's this new cool plastic hey, here's this cool new pesticide. Hey, here's this cool new uh, type of car, right? So science was mostly bringing benefits to people and we weren't so much into the cautionary tale of, whoa, 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 maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Maybe we're detecting a problem. It was much more head down, barrel, barrel forward and, and nuclear power was absolutely part of that. And people saw this as a great triumph of, of democracy and a great 
thing that was going to make the world a better place, an easier place, et cetera. And so by the time the 70s roll around, we're seeing huge growth in uh, design of nuclear power plants, of installation of nuclear power plants, and then of ultimately of activating and, and running nuclear uh, power plants. Um, yeah, okay, great. And so I uh, just, just have a note in here, uh, this notion of about 30% growth per year is what some of our renewables are getting to uh, uh, now. And, um, and actually, in some cases, are actually beginning to exceed that uh, if we're talking about things like offshore wind and things of that nature. So things are humming along. And then comes Three Mile Island. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and 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 the not officially fully melt that down, but but the the problem with that reactor, and that causes a huge amount of worry. Um, by the time the eighties roll around, now the 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 rate of expansion that we're on with nuclear power starts to slow down. The story right? The story is always that it is the environmentalists and the environmental opposition, primarily because of things related to waste, because we do not have a way, all of our nuclear waste right now, or virtually all of our nuclear waste, and all of our power plants across the U.S. are being stored on the power plant grounds themselves, in casks, in drums, etc. So we've, we've, even though we, we started this in the, in the 50s, right? we do not have a central repository for these substances, some of which have half-lives uh, longer, longer than our species has uh, been doing farming, for example. Um, and so, so that's a concern. And so uh, I think oftentimes the spin comes in that environmentalists really cause the problem. Environmentalists absolutely were major drivers of the slowdown of nuclear uh, expansion of nuclear power. But the other thing that always is uh, stepped around by the industry is the incredible costs of building these plants and the difficulty in getting them safely permitted. And so that's always sidestepped. And so I was like, oh, well, it's the same exact story as with um, um, stopping of harvesting old growth forests or stopping fishing and overfished uh, with overfished fish stocks all these things, right? It's always like, oh, the environmentalists cause the problem. Oftentimes, the environmentalists are coming into it when there already are significant economic issues already at play. The coal industry is another example. Coal is dying, regardless of what we're saying with climate change. Um, uh, climate change is just accelerating it, but, but um, coal was on its way out. Uh, it has been on its way out, independent of what environmentalists are doing. Just the basic uh, economics do not support using coal. Um, okay, and so the, okay, so then also um, we have the the ramifications of the um, oil crisis and and the oil embargoes in the '70s. So there's energy becomes this very complex mix. Um, we have the Chernobyl meltdown in 1986, which is our worst nuclear disaster ever, way worse than Fukushima. Um, it was it was really really bad, and it continues to be bad. Um, and then uh, uh, by, the, by the early 2000s, nuclear power is sort of uh, holding steady around 16%. And if you, you guys remember, what did I say it is now? Remember from a couple slides ago? Anybody? At, at least for the US. This, this is like, the global set. Like 8%? Right, right. So we're, so we're 8%, right? So, we, so we're getting more efficient, but we've, we're, we're starting to crank down in terms of the number of of reactors that are running, et cetera. And then we have the 2011 uh, uh, Fukushima Daiichi meltdown that um, uh, really uh, changes a lot of people's attitudes. If people's attitudes aren't already changed, it, it, there was a huge hit that, that's um, experienced in 2011. Okay, how are we doing on time? We about, um, uh, let's see, we'll go a couple more slides and we'll take our, we'll take our break, how about that? Any, oh, sorry, any questions so far? I'm just, I'm rambling on here talking. Is it, this should be all review or mostly review so far. Is that good, you guys? Good okay. for me. Okay, so just a couple more slides. So, so again, this is the, this is a, a 
um, illustration since we didn't have a camera in there, but this is, you know, our first, you know, control experiments in controlled nuclear uh, chain reaction uh, uh, underneath the um, football field at University of Chicago. Um, and then again, we, we started off this technology as a weapon of war and the very first bomb that we drop in war, and it's important to say that the only country that's ever deployed nuclear weapons, uh, explosive nuclear weapons, Russians might have done some stuff with radiation poisoning here and there with assassination type things. But, but as far as actual destructive explosive devices, we are the only country on planet Earth that's deployed nuclear uh, weapons um, against a, another country or next, against another population. And we've done that both in terms of at war and also during the Cold War um, in terms of bombing places like Anawitak and other uh, uh, remote Pacific islands. Um, so we hit Hiroshima. We then follow up a couple of days later with uh, Nagasaki. And, um, and that brings the Japanese uh, empire to its knees and they surrender essentially unconditionally. Um, okay, so why don't, why don't we, this is probably a good place to just pause for uh, 10 minutes. So we'll take our quick 10 minute break, you guys, take a stretch, uh, go get a drink of water and uh, we'll come back and we'll actually finish up by talking about um, really quickly types of nuclear reactors and then we'll get into some of our nuclear um, uh, disasters that we've had. Cool? I'll see everybody in 10 minutes. Hit that bad boy. Hit that bad boy. Get this guy going. Oops, gotta go through all this really, really, really. Okay, there we go. So um, here we go. So uh, uh, picking up where we left off, um, we have a couple of uh, common types currently deployed commercial re uh, nuclear reactors and power plants um, around the world and in the US. Um, there, there's a few other uh, more specialized designs and things like nuclear, um, aircraft carriers and, and uh, uh, breeder reactors and things like that in, in sort of research context. But this is what we're talking about for commercial power uh, generation, commercial electricity generation. Uh, so we have uh, pressurized water reactors, boiling water reactors, gas cooled fast reactors, um, uh, pressurized heavy water, light water graphite and um, fast neutron reactors. Um, the main cut, and then right here, I'm, I'm listing. This is a bit old now. This is this is about. This table is pretty old. This is almost 20 years old now, um, and so uh, I've not, I, I haven't kept track of um, who's who's sh shifting. But by and large, there's a long um, design period. There's a long ramp up period, and so I don't think these um, relative amounts have changed um, a, a huge amount. Um, a, a, in the in the intervening couple decades here, so um, pressurized water reactors we have, Japan has, uh, Russia has, etc. Um, and you'll see there's a couple design. These water reactors are what we use in the U.S. And as we go to um, other countries, um, uh, or, or some of the technologies deployed in other countries commercially, we don't typically uh, engage with. And um, yeah, so uh, this is, this is uh, again, this is not uh, updated in the last 20 years, but we haven't had a huge amount of new increase. Basically the red here are locations where we have nuclear power plants, nuclear reactors, and the blue indicate um, uh, the, the median point of a country that has some significant uranium deposits. And what you see by and large for the most part is the places where the reactors are, are not in the locations, um, generally speaking, uh, where the um, uh, uh, ore is to power these. We also see primarily nuclear power is big in Western wealthy uh, democracies and um, not so much in other 
uh, areas of the world. Although there's a few exceptions, but by and large, it's 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 North America, it's Western Europe, and it's Japan that primarily are deploying these as power sources. Uh, this is a pressurized water reactor. Again, uh, you guys don't so much care about this, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a couple examples when we get into um, disasters here. But um, basically different sizes. Um, key thing here is both of these have containment structures around the uh, reactor vessel. Um, uh, yeah, I don't even think, I, don't, I should, probably shouldn't even put these in here. I don't, I don't think this matters too much to us. This um, is the design that uh, failed at um, Chernobyl. This is a, a graphite um, uh, substance. Okay, so here we go. So, so just maybe I should have explained at least a little bit of this. Let's talk about this, this pressurized water reactor. So just we're on the same page, the orange uh, yellow would be the uh, material that are exposed or potentially exposed to the radioactive materials. So this is where um, the uh, water, for example, is, is, is cruising around. Uh, in the diagram here, it's not just in a diagram that shows the orange and the blue not mixing. The orange and the blue go by each other, but through a series of heat exchangers, through a series of essentially metal uh, conducting heat into the other vessels. So that radioactive water, that orange water doesn't physically mix with the blue water um, is the idea here. Um, and that, that continues on. Uh, when Again, we have, there's the fuel rods themselves, which is the, the uranium or the radioactive material. When we want there to be more reactions, we want the heat to go up, we remove the barriers in between those bars. So in this case, we remove the control rods and those control, by, by, by lifting those control rods out of the way, it, it heats up. And so by by sort of fine tuning that you can control the heat and therefore the amount of power that's generated from your uh, particular generator. In the case of Chernobyl, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, the, the material there, the moderator uh, is graphite. Well, there's control rods, but, 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 the, but the medium in which it's embedded is graphite, which is crazy because graphite is basically like coal, right? It's like, uh, putting our, our things that could cause a problem if they heat up into, uh, you know, a burnable chamber. And so uh, that is uh, not considered a smooth move. It wasn't considered a smooth move back then. And as the, the horrible events um, of 30 years ago showed, um, it, it led to bad things. Um, yeah, okay, great, just different designs. So at this point, you guys don't, don't so much care about that. But basically, um, uh, there's all kinds of stuff associated with, um, so one of the arguments that we should have more nuclear power is obviously uh, related to car uh, uh, carbon emissions and the amount of carbon generated uh, greenhouse gases is, is much less than uh, if we did um, a, uh, if we just burned fossil fuel directly. But it's important to say that it is by no means um, free from, from emissions, right? So all of the stuff that, so the actual, pulling out of the control rods and generating the heat and starting that, that power going, um, that obviously uh, uh, is, is minimally involving um, uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions, but the huge amount of lead time in the construction of the, the power plant itself, in the um, mining, the refining, all that kind of stuff, huge amounts of, um, of uh, of energy, embedded energy and associated emissions. Um, and that's often forgotten when we're having these, these conversations. And then there's some other designs and, and the nuclear uh, engineering uh, industry is always telling us, oh, there's some better design just down the road, just down the road. Um, we shall see. Okay, so let, let's get now to the actual disaster part. That was a, that was a lot of uh, prelim to get to disasters, but, um, here we go. This the Godzilla 1954. Have any of you guys seen the original Godzilla 1954 um, uh, movie with Raymond Burr? No. No. So I would, I would, uh, I mean, obviously you guys are we're getting near finals and things of that nature. So you guys probably have more important things to do, but, but I would suggest you put it on your watch list for uh, when you need to sort of have a, a, a tune out thing. Um, 
Does anybody know the story of Godzilla? Does anybody, anybody know the, the original story? It has been obviously many, many sequels since, but the original movie, does anybody know how it went? I remember when I was a kid, I loved the one in the 90s. I don't know if it's pretty much the same premise. <laughs> uh, different. It was different. It was different? different. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know the 90s. I don't remember the 90s one exactly. So maybe it wasn't that different, but I, I think it was different. But does anybody remember the actual plot of the of the 19th, the original, the first one? No. Okay. So the idea was, uh, so in the US, right, this is what we normally saw when we saw this. This was a monster movie. This was take your date out to the, to the movies and get some popcorn and sort of, you know, kind of a, a, a spectacle, visual spectacle and kind of a, you know, cotton candy bubblegum kind of monster movie along with like dracula or frankenstein or something of that nature so when american audiences primarily looked at this we saw a dude in a rubber suit right with the sort of funny eyeballs right and i was like okay whatever um remember this movie was made in japan and, and the version that we showed here was dubbed right so 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 there's japanese actors and then we had american uh actors um you know speak over their lines and things of that nature so um so spoken wise it sounded totally american and sounded totally uh, consumable but um so so it was basically a monster movie for us right it was that for the Japanese folks, but remember, this is just after, uh, just a few years after uh, Nagasaki, Hiroshima. And so the basic story here is that um, nuclear testing, and then from this, all kinds of other movies get spawn, spun out, right? The, the crazy ant movies, the ant them coming out of the desert and, and the crazy giant spiders and all these things, right, come in the wake of this. But, but this first one, nuclear testing wakes up this this dragon beast thing from underneath the ocean and and Godzilla comes and exacts retribution from the people of Japan right and causes destruction walks through the cities and destroys things and burns things down and steps on things and 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 the government appears mostly powerless to stop it right so they're shooting tanks and the added and guns and stuff and the big monster doesn't care right so that was really an allegory for um the war and for nuclear weapons and 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 the use of nuclear this this new this brave new world of science that we unleashed and so the idea is as we unleash this force there's some um unforeseen downside right there's something so you might call that a black swan right you might call that a gray rhino maybe we should call it a, a green godzilla or something <laughs> instead of a gray rhino or whatever but but again the idea is um this had a very different resonance in japan a country that was still rebuilding that was still you know down on its knees um compared to uh america so again, I would I would I would remind us of one of our themes here today is is it a feature or is it a bug of the system? So uh, let's flash forward to our um, first nuclear disaster that we'll talk about today, and so that's going to be um, China Syndrome. Now, has anybody seen this movie? This is 1979. Has anybody anybody seen this one? No. Oh, we're, we're making such a big. Such a, we should probably make a playlist of all the disaster films you guys should, if you haven't seen, we should make a list and we should, we should uh, have, a, have a class cur curated list. But, okay, so this is a story. Uh, this is a story of a fictional, so this is real important here. This is a fictional story of a new nuclear power plant. And without giving the whole story away, there's some, there's some shenanigans going on. And I'm using that word a lot lately. I don't, I don't know why I'm using shenanigans. I never use that word, but I'm using it a lot lately. Uh, so, so there's some shenanigans. There's some reporters here. There is a, a conscientious um, plant operator. And there's some worry about safety. And there's, of course, the evil corporate uh, business suit guys that are just like, shut up, shut up. We'll just keep doing it. It'll be, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. 
And so it's sort of a, a thriller type of movie. So this comes out and is, is released in theaters. And uh, just after this, it's still in theaters, we have um, Three Mile Island. And so at the, at the you know, Cineplex, you have people putting up signs saying, dude, this is happening right now. This isn't, this doesn't seem to be a fictional movie anymore. This seems to be a, um, a, a cautionary tale, or I mean, it's not a documentary, but almost like, you know, almost like a, a foreshadowing of what was going on. Now the term China syndrome is a, is a Hollywood made up thing, but the idea is if this power plant goes haywire and melts down, it'll be so this like slug of nuclear, whatever the hell puddle of molten, whatever um, is going to be so radioactive. It's going to burn all the way down to China, right? Of course it wouldn't happen, but, but that's where the, the names China syndrome comes from of the title of the movie. So as this is happening, um, three mile Island happens, which some people uh, you know, might see it referred to in the literature as TMI. It's not too much information. It's Three Mile Island. This is a nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania. So this is March of 79. Uh, unit two, uh, the re reactor number two, trips early in the morning. And uh, so some alarms kind of start going off. And uh, a, um, essentially a, a mechanical problem happens. One of the display um, uh, instruments uh, says something is, is not the way it actually is, right? So it leads to some misinformation inside the control room. And so engineers are trying to respond the way they think they should be responding, but because they have faulty information, it, it causes some problems. And they essentially have a loss of cooling a uh, loss of that, that medium that will, will uh, slow the reaction. And so they think they're doing the right thing, but in fact, they are having um, uh, a loss of coolant and the temperature is actually rising. And so as this is going on, they um, are also being hampered by the fact that they haven't drilled as much as they should have drilled and they haven't practiced as much of uh, this, you know, these situations that they should have. And so there's, there's an issue with preparation of the humans in the, in the mix, and then a problem of the, the data feeds going to those humans, right? So both things are acting in concert with one another, and it starts to, to go bad. And so by 6.30, they, um, they figure out, they, they kind of realize what's going on. So two and a half hours later, they figure out what's going on and they, they stop the loss of coolant, but the, the situation has already occurred such that the water level was below the top of the reactor core. So you have the, the uh, rods and, the, and the, the control rods and the, and the matrix and everything, and the water levels below that. So that's allowing buildup of um, heat and allowing the pellets to actually get so hot that they're in the air, essentially, they start melting. And as they melt, all these fuel rods typically are covered with some type of zinc alloy. Um, and essentially the, the, the coating starts to melt and then they start, and then the material can more easily react with the atmosphere. And, and so we start releasing radioactive gas into the, the, the head space right around the reactor itself. Um, and we start to generate basically a bubble of hydrogen. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's, it's just a, a chemi chemical reaction and, and this potentially explosive material builds up and builds up and there's huge worries that if some spark or some, some thing falling or something of that nature could lead to an explosion and then rupture the entire containment vessel and then expose this melting radioactive core to the atmosphere. And so um, th they initially start uh, an evacuation um, that will lead to 150,000 people saying, you know, a warning saying, get out of your house, go, 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 go now, don't grab photos, just go. Um, so in, in retrospect, 
Uh, turns out that, that it probably was unlikely that we would have a hydrogen explosion, but it, but it was possible. Okay, it was possible. So the, the, um, the industry was saying, after this said, oh yeah, I know that was, you know, it couldn't have happened, but um, we'll see later a, a case like this actually did happen. Um, so the major lessons that come out of Three Mile Island, as far as the industry is concerned, and the regulators are concerned, the federal regulators, are we need better operator training uh, and we need better emergency planning. So we need to have clearer decision trees when, when there's a problem, who do you contact and who does that person contact and when do they activate the EMS and all that kind of stuff. So that, need, that, that gets a huge overhaul in the wake of this 1979 disaster. Um, so the industry will say, the industry said, yeah, yeah, no, it's all good. Nobody died, right? N nobody was injured. It was, you know, we, we handled it. It was an accident. It was bad. It shouldn't have happened. But, you know, we're, we're doing a good job. Um, as they argue, off-site radiation is relatively minimal. And it's just a small fraction of the overall background exposure of those, you know, 100,000 odd people living around the um, power plant. Um, but the big, huge issue was public confidence. And, the, and we cannot underestimate the, the, the power of China Syndrome, the movie that was sort of setting in the public's mind what, you know, I mean, it, it, was, it was crazy how, how, how similar it was, right? Um, I'm, I'm not implying, in the movie, there's some nefarious actors. I'm not implying that, that industry folks were nefarious or anything, but, but just sort of in broad strokes, it was pretty trippy that, that you saw a fiction and then it seemed as if that fiction was playing out on the nightly news. Um, so huge crisis of confidence that the industry, I would argue, hasn't fully recovered from. And, uh, and the industry will tell you lots of health effects, and we've studied all the health effects of this and we cannot um, see a clear signal of increased rates of cancer or anything of, of that nature. And so uh, uh, lawsuits that were filed by citizens and people around, et cetera, uh, were um, uh, dismissed 20 years later. So it took till the late nineties for this um, uh, to be settled in the courts, right? So this tells you that there, there was a, a long lag time in terms of trying to figure out the science, trying to figure out the public health consequences of this nuclear release, and then to work its way through the courts and the lawyers and all that kind of craziness. Um, and again, as I mentioned already, that there, there's a lot of, of there, there's, there's a huge um, revision in terms of how we train operators and engineers of, of nuclear power plants in the wake of this. So turning back to that, um, to this figure that I showed you before, this is why that dip. So Three Mile Island is what causes this dip, right? Otherwise, the industry seemed poised to keep going straight up on a very, uh, if not exponential, at least linear increase. And Three Mile Island absolutely puts the brakes on the industry, right? And that was not caused by environmentalists, right? That was caused by the industry themselves and the the systems that were designed by the industry and approved by the federal government. So this was um, very much so a self-inflicted wound, even though the narrative is often tried to be spun as if these external forces and public opinion turned against them, uh, they turned public opinion against themselves, I would argue. I think it's, it's quite obvious that that's what happened. Um, so again, bug or feature, right? So the industry would say, oh, this was a bug, right? This was a, 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 a unforeseen problem and we didn't understand this was happening. This was an accident. Um, is it a bug or is it part of how the system was designed, right? Um, okay, number next, uh, let's talk, oh, questions about Three Mile Island? No, okay. Um, so number next is a Chernobyl. So this is uh, not quite a decade later. Um, after the Three Mile Island event. Now, now Three Mile Island is the worst nuclear um, power plant uh, uh, disaster in, the, in US history. Chernobyl is the worst nuclear power plant disaster in the history of the world. Uh, so this uh, happens just before um, uh, uh, my birthday. 
And initially it's clamped down, hardcore, hardcore clamped down. No information is coming out. So the Soviet, this is the, the uh, Soviet Union at the time, Soviet Union clamps down and says nothing's happening. There starts to be burbles in the diplomatic corps and the spy networks and all that stuff. People start to hear something's going on, but the, the Soviet um, uh, propaganda arm, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And then we start seeing radiation uh, sensors around Eastern Europe start going off, right? And, and so you can't deny it. Like, where is all this radiation coming from? And so it takes a couple of days. Finally, the Soviet Union admits that this Chernobyl event was unfolding. And so on my birthday, this is not my birthday, but this, this is uh, um, a little bit after that. But on my birthday, um, the big news was time. Uh, and this is, this is before the internet's a thing, right? And everything. So now you guys are used to instant information that's on your phone. But this was, they, they were going to print with Time Magazine. They took off the old cover and they, they, they um, uh, sort of transmitted the pictures and they get, it was on the cover of Time Magazine. So it was this huge deal. And then after that, the news broke on April 29th and it just went crazy. So we're talking about uh, this old um, graphite reactor in the Ukraine, what's, what's, what's now the modern country of Ukraine, then was, was a part of the USSR. And um, this was a really bad reactor design. So again, bug or feature and very weak operational controls. So the operators didn't really know what they were doing and they were doing an, an unsanctioned test of the system when things start to go awry. Um, so they basically have um, a, a problem and uh, things start to get out of hand. And because of the bad design, they, they, they can't, um, can't uh, short circuit the reaction. And so, so temperature builds up, temperature builds up, temperature builds up. Um, the water becomes steam and it blows off the cover of the internal part of the reactor. And then uh, it breaks some pipes with the, the coolant water. And then that water starts to spill and the graphite matrix catches fire. And then it's pretty much game over at that point. Um, uh, yeah, right. So basically um, it's, it's, it's bad things that are happening. We have all kinds of release. Now, when we talk about things like Three Mile Island released some, some radiation in terms of some of the, the coolant and things of that nature, um, that, that's bad, that's not good, but that's sort of one level of bad. When we have the fire, so, so the, the easiest things to, uh, to spread radiation, steam, you know, you know, liquid, and gas. Um, those are not good, but that can happen. The much more problematic things are stuff that's more uh, soot. And so when we start to have these fires and actually combusting material, the, the chemical transformation and the mobilization of radionuclides um, is much more problematic, much greater, much, 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 much more dangerous. And that's what's happening here in the Chernobyl thing. And so we start seeing this. Um, one of the fir first things we see in the West is all of a sudden there's this huge run on iodine because because um, now to be, uh, without going, again, we're not a chemistry class here, but, um, but just to, to make sure we're on the same page, um, the different isotopes of iodine are more or less radioactive, depending on which version we're talking about, right? Or plutonium or whatever we're talking about, uh, tritium, whatever. Um, but chemically, the iodine isotopes are gonna behave the same, okay? So what does that mean? That means that um, uh, if we get exposed to iodine, uh, our body would take it up. So our, our thyroid and different things take up iodine and our body is a normal part of our mammalian physiology. And so uh, one thing that, that, that's the first thing that I remember happening in the wake of Chernobyl is all of a sudden there's this huge run on iodine. The idea is everybody wants to take this iodine. They, they essentially wanna fill up their body with quote unquote, good iodine so that they uh, won't get this other iodine. Turns out that's probably totally a waste of effort and stuff, but, but nevertheless, um, uh, th that's one of the first signals. And then people start getting worried about the food supply and, 
and agriculture and all this and that. And are, are these crops, et cetera, being dusted with this toxic uh, material coming from uh, uh, the, this, this plant? So, so I'm gonna have you guys watch, rather than, than show you some of these videos, because there, there's, some, there's some very interesting videos, I'm gonna have you guys watch those uh, separate from our lecture. Um, cause they do, they'll do a better job than I will in terms of, um, uh, sort of painting the picture for what happened with, um, Chernobyl. Suffice it to say, um, one of the huge aspects of this was misinformation and was propaganda and was, um, an absolute interest in controlling the message rather than responding to the, with the science, rather than responding with facts and with objective, um, uh, uh, responses to the problem at hand. Um, so what happens that there's a fire going, right? So the authorities say, hey, you firemen, go in there and, and put out the fire, right? So many of these folks had no equipment, not, not, not just bad equipment or, or, or limited PPE or, or whatever it is. Um, they had nothing. And so they're in there trying to fight and put out this fire um, in some cases, it's it's dudes with you know trucks and water squirting on it. In other cases, they they bring in um, helicopters and they try dumping clay and things of that nature. One of the helicopters crashes. I mean, it's just it's just, it's just bad, 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 bad stuff. Um, Thirty one of these workers within a few days end up dying just straight up from the like the physical burns. I mean, that they're they're so cooked essentially from this radiation. Um, um, there's, as I mentioned, a huge release across um, a wide area, but in particular across much of Eastern Europe um, because of the prevailing winds at the time, the way the, the weather patterns were, were uh, going and, and just impact a lot of stuff. So in Turkey, where I um, uh, used to work, uh, everybody in Turkey drinks tea. And um, one of the most popular teas is this tea called apple tea. And um, uh, there was huge, and so, and so in Turkey, it's called chai and a lot of the Middle East, like tea is the thing, right? And, um, and there was huge controversy because the Turks had to destroy large amounts of their tea crop, of, of, of the, the plants that they used to make the leaves that they used to make their tea, they put in their tea bags. Um, and it was, you know, culturally hugely problematic. So it wasn't just that we can't eat something, it was that it really targeted something that was was deeply fundamental about their their traditions and stuff, and that was and they were really ticked off. And it was big news when when you know a couple of years later uh, the prime minister declares that okay now things are safe, it's okay to grow tea again, and it's okay to drink tea from these impacted areas. And you know famously went on like like you'd see with Fauci getting the first vaccine, you know sit there sat there and made made tea out of some of these. Um, uh, new plants and, and drank it and said it's okay, but but huge worries about uh, food systems, et cetera, across the area. And again, uh, why? One, it's a huge problem. Just it would be it would have been a problem no matter what happened. But the fact that there was this sense of not getting the truth, not hearing the full extent of the problem, made everyone very much so on edge and made everyone think that they couldn't believe um, whatever was coming out of the Soviet Union. And this strongly impacted um, at another, so we had Three Mile Island, really an American phenomenon. Chernobyl was a global phenomenon. And so this um, was in the news and it was crazy and it was just insane. And it really shook the global confidence in nuclear power and people became much more worried and much more concerned that this technology for energy generation maybe wasn't worth the bargain. Um, and then actually just in the 30th anniversary, just in the last uh, few uh, months, there's been some studies that have come out in terms of trying to look at what, what you know, how many people actually, uh, can we measure increased radiation exposure, et cetera? And the long story short is um, there is clearly some increased rates of, of disease and illness, et cetera, but that um, not as much as we originally thought there, there could have been. And as it turns out, it seems like a lot of the damage, and we've seen this with, with many of our disasters, we've seen this with Katrina, we've seen this with Deepwater Horizon, with oil spills, we've seen this with uh, earthquakes, which is the, um, 
yes, there is the, the physical danger that your body's exposed or, or the, the problems there, but the psychological stress, the stress of not knowing. So these people weren't being told anything. So even though it seems that by and large, they were mostly okay in terms of, um, uh, for most of them, in terms of the residents in the area that evacuated, they're mostly okay. But they weren't hearing anything. And so for decades, they you know, worried, am I, hey, next month, am I going to get cancer? Next month, am I going to get leukemia? And that chronic stress in and of itself is very dangerous and unhealthy, but it also leads to very unhealthy behavior. So if you think that maybe, man, I'm, I'm going to die when I'm young, so screw it, I'm going to start doing this substance or drinking that thing or behaving this way, right? So there, there's, there's increased rates of divorce. There's increased rates of, um, uh, you know, domestic violence, um, all, all the different uh, things that come from people that are not, that, that are just stressed out all the time and worried and not confident that they have a, a productive, healthy life in front of them. And so that, that absolutely is part of the Chernobyl story. We end up entombing the, the, because it was so crazy and we couldn't deal with it, they just end up creating a big giant um, concrete uh, uh, tomb that they put around this area and it remains to this day. And in fact, the current concerns are now we need to um, redo that because it, it uh, wear and tear and erosion and uh, weakness and all this and that, it's, it's, it's getting time for um, the next version of this entombment. Um, and so uh, what are we going to do with that? And an interesting thing from an ESRM perspective is the fact that this impact zone became a de facto protected area. So because humans were evacuated and just abandoned the place, uh, wolves could, weren't being hunted anymore and bears weren't being hunted anymore, right? And, and things of that nature. And so so um, while there absolutely is some damage to some of the critters, some of our colleagues, some of the colleagues I collaborate with have done their PhD dissertations, et cetera, on things like birds in these um, uh, radiation areas. And so while there's downsides to the, to the birds in terms of mutagenesis and things of that nature, so negative traditionally is the foot of humanity on these species that actually they seem to by and large be doing better in these exclusion areas where humans have been for the most part uh, kept out of. Um, and so that notion of a de facto protected area is actually a fairly interesting consequence of this uh, and other of these things. Uh, so as when these things, these things happen all the time, we have this with Fukushima, people start to say, hey, so can this happen here? By and large, it was the, again, the design of the uh, reactor is very different from the kind of reactors we have here in the U.S. and it, indeed around much of the rest of the world. And so uh, just, just it, we have a very different design um, around our uh, uh, nuclear power plants. Um, and we also have much more robust institutional controls. Not, not that we couldn't have a failure, right? But, but that um, our permitting is much more robust we, for all the problems we have, and we have a lot of problems with our governance right now, as you guys can all list, um, we at least don't have an authoritarian government, right? So the author authoritarian government that might hide in the initial days of a global pandemic and allow that sucker to escape, or that um, uh, uh, might deny that there's any radiation coming out and not warn the citizens early enough, et cetera. So at least we don't have that uh, going on. And so the takeaway lesson from Chernobyl, other than don't use graphite reactors and stupid things of that nature and tell the truth, you know, shocker. Um, uh, the, the real idea here is that safety must be baked into your culture of operation. And you have to have the system design such that even if people uh, are, are doing the wrong thing, the system should be robust enough to, um, to not melt down, basically. Um, okay. So that, so uh, Three Mile Island, uh, Chernobyl. Now we're gonna talk about uh, Fukushima, but let me pause real quick. So, so questions so far about those, those first couple examples, those first couple nuclear power plant disasters, anybody wondering anything about those? 
I don't have a question, but I put a link in the chat for um I don't know oh, if you've cool. seen it already, the Chernobyl uh, miniseries on HBO. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So now okay, so uh, did you watch it? Yeah, it's really good. Has anybody has anybody else here? Wa I've actually not watched it, but um uh has anybody else watched it? I haven't. So it's yeah, so though it's interesting. So I um I don't know, but there's some things I just have a hard time watching. So um, Treme, which is a, a series, also a fantastic series um, about uh, New Orleans post Katrina. I watched the first several episodes, and it was you know fantastic acting, great stuff. A lot of our friends that are musicians are in it. In it, but it it eventually um, got too close to home, and the things that you know, fantastic job telling the stories. You know, sort of slightly fictionalized, but but really saying what happened. I found it too hard to watch. I couldn't watch. I was getting too bummed out and sad and disturbed. So, um, so I don't have a personal connection to Chernobyl, so I could probably watch that one. But, but sometimes when I watch these disaster things, it, 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 um, it, it makes me too sad. So, uh, but I will try yeah, to watch. I know what you mean. I, I will try to watch. <laughs> I will try to watch the uh, Chernobyl. It, it was supposed to be amazingly well done, and 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 you know production value and acting and all stuff was supposed to be great. So that, that, that'd be another another one to add to our uh, disasters uh, watch list. So that's great. Thank you for putting that in there. That's great. that's great. Yeah, and the craziest thing from that show I learned about was the elephant's foot at Chernobyl. So I, had, I didn't know what that was before, but it's what, like- tell me? I'm not sure. I don't know if I know what that is. Tell me. It's the big blob of radioactive stuff that's still at Chernobyl and it's still- so hot and it's going to be hot for centuries oh, oh, oh the slide the the, the melted down core yeah, yeah but they call it the elephant's foot because it's okay. shaped like one it's crazy it is crazy it is totally crazy and i think um you know we talk about climate change we talk about these decisions that we've made as a society sometimes actively made sometimes we've just sort of sidestepped into it or or not paid too much attention to making these decisions that have these very long lasting consequences. And absolutely, um, I, I think, uh, well, climate change is, is threatening to maybe be even more problematic than, than nuclear waste. <laughs> but, but nuclear waste is one of those deals where, you know, absolutely, how do we, uh, you know, it's gonna outlive us. It's definitely gonna outlive me, it's definitely gonna outlive you guys. And it's, it may well outlive our civilization. And how do you impart warning or caution or whatever? And it just, it's, seems very arrogant to well I'm, I'm i'm pontificating here but it, but it seems it's 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 an interesting thing that uh a few folks decided over a couple of years that we're going to do something but then the consequences are going to live with us for for forever and a lot of things in our society that way but but there's few things that have the longevity of of uh things like a, a nuclear meltdown um yeah it's crazy Great. Other questions or other comments anybody had so far about that stuff? Okay, cool. So, um, so let's talk about uh, uh, Fukushima. So again, I, I'll, I'll have some um, videos I want you guys to watch that'll do a better job of, of going through some of this stuff than, than I can do. Um, because I didn't, I haven't actually worked directly on uh, Fukushima. Um, but uh, Okay, so let, let's set the stage. So, so Japan, right, um, hugely decimated by World War II. So they were a very early adopter uh, and embracer of nuclear power. So um, in the wake of World War II, they, they lost their military and all this and that. They lost their expansionist empire. They, didn't, they don't have a whole lot of oil uh, you know, on their own territory. They're a small island, well, essentially a relatively small island nation, right? They're not technically what we call a small island nation. There's, there's a definition for that. That would be something like Palau. But, but they're not a massive country like Russia or Australia or something of that nature, right? So, so they were starting in a, a position of weakness and they were starting in a position with not a lot of potential resources for um, energy generation, potentially in a modern industrial society. And so because of those factors and others, they um, really start, they really early on embrace um, um, civilian nuclear power generation and kind of go whole hog into this um, endeavor. 
so um, by the time of the 2000s roll around, they're getting about a third of all their electricity from nuclear power plants around the country. Now, uh, as we know, as I've mentioned before, we know a lot of what we know about earthquakes. We know a lot of what we know about tsunamis, et cetera, from Japan. And so they're very much so aware of this. They, they teach a lot of the rest of the world how to design and, and live with these threats. Um, and so they design their plants to, to deal with, uh, you know, strong shaking events, earthquakes and, and the like. So they have a lot of nuclear. So beforehand, they have a lot of nuclear industry. And a lot of that is, is supposedly designed to withstand the, um, the, 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 you know, potential natural disasters that might be coming around. Um, so this is what the area looks like before. Now, this is on Japan's east coast, sort of northeastern coast. And uh, so here we're looking at the power plant. So there's a total of six reactors uh, at this site. And like so many of our power plants, they're using water as the coolant, whether that's a coal-fired power plant or a natural gas fire plant, whatever. So we love to put our power plants right on the coast. We love to put our power plants right in estuaries, salt marshes coastal areas, et cetera. So we have access to this big volume of water, which we can use as a, as a thermal uh, inertia to bring down the temperature. <clears throat> um, okay, so uh, uh, six units, six different reactor units. And at the time, uh, units five and six are fueled, but they're, they're turned off. They were intentionally depowered and, and were not planned to be on that day. Um, uh, units uh, one, two, and three were operating. Unit four was uh, experiencing some maintenance. And so it was, it didn't have any um, um, uh, fuel rods in it, right? Um, yeah, I don't know what happened with this lame diagram I put in here, but. Um, yeah, okay, it doesn't matter. Forget that, that was an ugly picture. Okay, so um, so now the, their containment vessels uh, looks kind of like this. Oh, so maybe this is this is sort of like a, an elephant's foot before it's an elephant's foot. So this is this is what it looks like before it. So that's the thing around it is the torus. <clears throat> there's a, there's a, the center part is essentially where in the middle of that sort of like the bulge, the bottom is where the nuclear uh, uh, fuel rods are gonna be. <clears throat> And uh, and then this this is the primary containment vessel, and then the bill, and then and then these things are the secondary containment structures, the things that we're seeing from from the air and far away. Um, what do I want to say? Uh, yeah, okay. So I'll just say that just to start with. Okay, so um, so here is here is the the primary containment structure inside, right? which is this part right here. And then this is the outer stuff around it. Now, uh, so this is where the, the, all the action's happening in the, in the regular uh, going on of the power plant. Over here, up here, this is a, a storage area for um, fuel rods, right? So areas that we're getting ready to uh, you know, take out of the reactor or, or, or get ready to put in the reactor, et cetera. And um, it turns out this was a part problem for, uh, was it four? Wait, uh, yeah, I think for four, this becomes a problem because people are thinking, hey, is, there's no fuel in there, so it's not a problem. There was no fuel in the main reactor part. But, um, but okay, so, so we go on and uh, we have the earthquake happen. <clears throat> so the earthquake happens <clears throat> in March of 2011. Excuse me, I have to have something to drink. Now this earthquake um, is the largest to ever strike Japan in, in, in recorded history. It's the fourth strongest ever in just history of recorded earthquakes in general. And it's, it, it immediately starts this very uh, strong uh, tidal wave that arrives less than an hour from the onset of the first shaking, right? Or, or I should say, uh, makes landfall 
And in my previous lecture uh, that I just re I recorded last night for you guys on, on tsunamis, um, I show some crazy, crazy video of the tsunami coming ashore. We don't have any direct video at the Fukushima plant itself, um, but we have lots of video from other areas, other surrounding areas um, in, in Japan that were being impacted by this insanely strong tsunami. So uh, right there uh, at, the, at the plant, um, we're getting 15 meter high waves. Um, uh, there's at least seven. So um, again, uh, I talk about this in our tsunami lecture, but um, it's important for you guys to remember that with tsunamis, um, it's not necessarily that the first wave causes a problem. Oftentimes the strongest wave will be the follow-up wave or the, the secondary wave or the secondary series of waves. And so uh, in the case of uh, this event, there's at least seven different um, major, major pushes inland uh, in some parts of Japan. And, it's, and so how the tsunami manifests itself is highly dependent on the local geography. So if we're, if we're straight up and down cliffs like Malibu, um, not so much. If we're super flat area like Ormond Beach, or Oxnard or Port Wainimi, that that uh, tidal that, that that tsunami can go much farther inland, and so in some of those areas we get uh, as much as a 12-story uh, tidal uh, a tsunami wave high, and in some parts it goes as far inland as 10 kilometers inland. So this is a huge, huge event. So the good news is the earthquake happens, and um, all of the, uh, you know, excellent engineers in Japan uh, uh, perceive, and the systems perceive the earthquake, they properly, uh, 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 what do I say, scrum, is that the right word I'm looking for? I don't know. Um, uh, uh, scram, sorry, scram the reactor, I don't want to say scram, scram the reactor, so, so turn everything off, drop the control rods in, so stop the nuclear reaction, turn off the power plant, etc. Um, and and there's some shaking, obviously it's a massive earthquake. So there's some tiles and things fall off the walls and, and all this and that at the power plant. But by and large, things are fine. So, so indeed, uh, in, the first, in the, the first sort of checking on their plants, uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, um, the, the entity that, that, that controls the power plant, that owns the power plant, um, the municipality, uh, you know, things that they were like, dodge a bullet, great, everything's cool. We shut everything down, it's all good. Um, unfortunately, um, what happens is the tidal wave, the, the tsunami comes in and screws stuff up. So, so they, they, they did a good job in terms of managing, designing, responding to the earthquake. They did a very poor job with dealing with the, uh, uh, going subtitle of the plant. Um, so we have essentially, and you'll see it when I, when you guys watch these videos later, but, but um, you know, the plant is physically damaged. Uh, and so that, that's a problem in of itself, but importantly, the power, the, the power systems to the plant are nuked. The, I should, nuked, I should be careful in this lecture using that term. The power plant, the, 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 the power systems are damaged. So after the tsunami hits, when things start to go awry and there starts to be a meltdown, they don't have the ability to move water around, to move coolant around, to change things. So they've lost control of the plant at that point. So um, we see uh, uh, initially with uh, uh, two reactors and then a third reactor, things just start going awry and they have no ability to intervene. And uh, it just gets worse and worse and worse. Um, and, and so the, yeah, so we're almost a break. So, um, so this might be a good point, I guess, to, to take a break. Um, suffice it to say, the, um, the impact here is uh, this rapidly uh, takes over the news. So um, very few people died as a result of this nuclear power plant um, uh, breaking and having a meltdown and all that kind of stuff. 
uh, you know, up um, something on the order of 16,000 people died in the earthquake and the tsunami, right? So that was the huge tragedy. But because radiation and because we're so freaked out about radiation and we're so um, primed to see disaster when things like Three Mile Island, when things like Chernobyl happens, this very quickly captures the attention of the world. And then from those of us outside of Japan, this really comes to dominate the narrative of this huge, so three disasters. We have the earthquake, huge problem in and of itself. We have the tsunami, huge problem in and of itself. And then we have this compromising and melting down of a major nuclear power plant in the coastal zone. All three of those are hugely problematic, dangerous, things that need to be managed. But you, you wouldn't know it from most of the world media. Everything came to be about um, uh, radiation, 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 radiation. I'll tell you one quick story, and then we'll, we'll take our, our 10 minute break here. Um, uh, the story I'll, I'll say is that, uh, so I was at a conference for the Deepwater Horizon. So the Deepwater Horizon happened in 2010, right? This is happening in 2011. So I was at a conference in New Orleans uh, about what was going on with the Deepwater Horizon. So I had a team that was uh, looking into what was going on with, um, with the Deepwater Horizon. So I was at this meeting in New Orleans. So I was staying at this hotel room and we'd had a break. It was between sessions or something, between poster sessions or between what, I don't remember what. And so I went up to my room to, I don't know, go to the bathroom or to get a soda or something, whatever it was. And I went and I dropped my, I remember dropping my bag on the um, bed and uh, I turned on the television and because it's one of these downtown hotels, it, it, it defaults to some channel that they that the cable companies pay them for, right? And it turns out it defaulted to Fox. So it turns on Fox News. And, you know, not going to get political here or anything, but, but um, uh, I would just say Fox News is not known for their robust science coverage. And uh, I see a physicist uh, <laughs> on the Fox News and this anchor is talking to him. And the anchor looks very scared. So the anchor looks very, very pale and is, is leaning forward and he's asking questions. And then I notice that there's like, a because normally when I'd see a scientist on Fox News, I would see a uh, statement, statement, statement from the host, scientists say something and the host would immediately jump on and say, well, what you really mean to say is, or aren't using your agenda, this or that. And instead the host was saying something and then being quiet for like, for like 10 minutes. And the scientist, the physicist in this case, was just talking and answering. And the host was actually listening to the scientist and it was, was making notes. And I remember like, what's going on here? I, I, I sort of had it down, I didn't really know what was going on. I started turning up, I'm like, wait, there's radiation? Why are they talking about radiation? And I, I couldn't understand. And then it became really clear. So the way you get science on uh, Fox News is to threaten uh, radiation hazard and radiation danger. And then that will get them uh, to actually listen to scientists. So clearly uh, COVID won't do it, other things won't do it, but, but uh, a fear of being irradiated apparently is the secret to getting um, uh, uh, objective science uh, spoken on uh, that particular uh, channel. Okay, so with that, we'll take a quick break. We'll take a 10 minute break and we'll come back and, and, and uh, finish up here talking about uh, nuclear disasters. So I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. And reshare my screen. And while I'm while I'm spinning this up, do you guys have any? Um, how can I share my screen? Do you guys have any questions while we're waiting for this thing to to spin up? There we go. My computer is being super laggy for some reason. My computer clearly doesn't want us to, to record what's going on, I guess. Okay, there we go. Uh, no questions, it sounds like. Okay, okay. if no questions, I'm gonna keep going. Um, so, so yeah. Um, so uranium itself is very radioactive, right? Um, it's 
refined uranium more radioactive from like people using like power plants or is like natural uranium more radioactive? Uh, we uh, enrich it. We enrich it. So, so uh, the stuff we use in the, in the power plants is going to be more, more potent. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good question. Good question. Um, okay, so a couple other things just to wrap up here because we're, we're getting on with time and I need to talk about a couple other um, more local stories for us. Uh, uh, again, whenever we have these disasters, it goes with just repeating, um, stuff just gets out there. People are desperate for information, especially when it's scary or you know it's a wildfire or something of that nature. So this was making the rounds as a radiation map. This was not a radiation map. This was a, a tsunami propagation map. Uh, a map uh, that NOAA generated. So, so uh, if you are doing some reading or looking around, you find some of these, make sure you're checking your source. And indeed, if you actually look at the diagram, it, it said, oops, it said, uh, it says tsunami on it, but not, not all the people sharing it had that on it. Um, again, uh, owing to our fears here in, in California, I don't know how many, you know, queries we got about um, you know living on the coast of California from reporters and stuff we're making all these maps right this <laughs> there is more to the world than just North America shocker shocker but you know we still started seeing all these maps about this is how many uh, days it was going to take the radiation to get to Alaska this is how many days it was going to take it to get to you know coastal you know Pacific Canada and how many days it was going to take to get to us on the mainland and all this kind of stuff so everything was about us about the American perspective it's also important to remember that we should be thinking what the people experiencing this, this disaster, what they're experiencing and how we can best be supporting them and helping them, um, not necessarily worrying about what it means for us. Uh, this is a little, uh, so this map here on the right, this is uh, a map from uh, professional researchers and this is deposition of cesium-137. Uh, and so not surprisingly, in areas closer to the power plant, that's where we saw the greatest deposition of this uh, radionuclide. Um, and this is just a, a brief summary of the ecological impacts as we understand them right now of the um, meltdown. So uh, radioactive fallout was dispersed uh, you know, all around the, the region, um, but the areas northwest of the plant um, because of the prevailing winds and things at the time, that's really where most of the radiation, uh, the strong, the, the most concentrated radiation um, went uh, in, in the wake of the, um, the problem. Uh, it's now, with, so the Japanese, every time they go fishing now, they're checking all of this seafood and all this kind of stuff. We still find in our surveys here in California, when we ask people about this, there's still hesitation about seafood from Japan. Um, uh, it's gotten much better than, you know, 10 years ago, but initially there was huge aversion to, to Japanese seafood, at least if you ask people about that and you got them to think about it, they're like, oh yeah, I probably shouldn't eat that. But uh, by and large, most food stuff seem to be totally fine from Japan, um, with, the, with a few exceptions, one of those being uh, wild boar, one of the species that's responded just like Chernobyl uh, in, in, um, has done uh, very well and populations have grown in, in and around the uh, Fukushima prefecture, the area near the exclusion zone. Um, and uh, the ongoing problem now is how we deal, as, as we were mentioning before with the, the elephant's foot in Chernobyl, how we deal with this, with this reactor. Let me just be clear, it's not cleaned up. A decade later, we, we, we're still having problems just getting to the material. It's so radioactive. As we've tried to deploy robots, in fact, we, we've we've gone to competitions um, where where um, DARPA had a competition to one year to do a robot to respond to, uh, you know, a, a human articulated robot to go in um, to respond to something like a nuclear meltdown to to get in a you had to get in a jeep and you had to drive around for a while and then you it, you had to get out and walk over some steps and stuff. But, but the, the model was, hey, what if we need a robot to go in and, and, and handle a nuclear meltdown or something of that nature? Most of the, the robots we've sent in have fried. The radiation is so intense, they just, they, their electronics got, got scrambled and they just sort of died. 
Um, so we still have a huge problem. We have tried freezing with basically liquid nitrogen, creating a sort of solid frozen wall of ice, subsurface ice, to not let that water move anywhere. But but there's so much groundwater just from the nor normal goings ons of things. There's so much groundwater that's going through that system. They essentially have to pick it up and put it somewhere. And so we fill up these huge tanks, and then they they um, essentially uh, release that into the the local coastal zone and um, that ticks people off so so we are still figuring out how we're going to deal with this and it's going to be a long time before we get this radio radioactive area uh, contained and and cleaned up another another really cool thing about this uh, has been the growth of citizen science because there wasn't a lot of data um, initially and, and Geiger counters were kind of expensive, uh, a couple of groups spun up, spun up, including a safe cast being the most um, a prominent of essentially do it yourself DIY. How do you build your own um, uh, Geiger counters? And since you're doing that much like purple air for air quality and things of that nature, can we build this thing for cheap? You know, pennies on the dollars compared to what we normally would would charge and then we can get them out to people and we can get them around and we can actually be at much more robustly much more accurately measuring and mapping out the radiation and so we can understand how dangerous the radiate radioactive fields are around this plant and so this is an example of from the safecast website um, of of this effort this crowdsourced effort this diy effort for citizens to map the radiation level uh, in and around Fukushima Prefecture. Another uh, one that I'll tie in just before we go on, talking about our last couple of examples for uh, time here, uh, is um, so. But, so in the, in the immediate wake of the Fukushima uh, disaster, we had about another 27 gigawatts of reactor. Um, the reactors are already in the pipeline. We're getting ready to turn on and indeed came online. But because of safety concerns uh, highlighted by Fukushima, um, as well as other things, other alternative potential sources for electricity, um, 22, giga, 22 gigawatts of nuclear, of previously existing nuclear generating capacity went away. So even though we're still bringing, um, we still have more after uh, the Japanese tsunami than before. It's, it's not as much as it otherwise would have been. So it absolutely had major impacts in terms of encouraging different entities to, uh, to not have active nuclear reactors uh, or to get at least have fewer nuclear reactors. Um, okay, um, and, and so uh, and, and now in general, Separate from all these disasters, we're, we're ne next going to talk about decommissioning very briefly. But um, regardless of if we all love nuclear power, want more of it, more of it, more of it, these plants are designed with a certain lifespan. Anytime we build something, a bridge, a dam, or whatever, there's, there's, there's a, a lifespan for that, right? Uh, it gets a little more complicated with uh, a nuclear power plants because the radiation itself um, unlike if we just had, say, a, um, a warehouse, the radiation itself actually has um, very clear potential implications for the structural integrity of some of these things, steel, concrete, stuff of that nature. And so the radiation um, adds essentially more wear and tear uh, than if, this was, if these were just traditional structures with no radioactive materials inside of them. And so what we find is that uh, uh, Way more than half of our existing nuclear power plants as of uh, last year or so um, have been operating for at least 30 years. And almost 100 of them have been operating for at least 40 years, right? That's a long time. That's a long, long time. And so, so regardless of what, we're, what we would theoretically like to do, many of these plants are either at or exceed, or approaching, or exceeding their their um, useful lifespans, and you you can sometimes do an extension for a few years, a decade, or fifteen more years, but you can't do that indefinitely. So we're reaching the end of life, and as we've as we've not brought in more nuclear uh, capacity, 
um, we we are going to unless something radically changes be seeing nuclear power po power play less of a mix in global energy uh, electricity supplies. Okay, so I want to just end with a couple close examples by us. Um, we uh, uh, have uh, we have medical reactors and research reactors and things of that nature, but as far as nuke as far as uh, uh, commercial power plant operations, um, I want to talk about our remaining two nuclear power plants here in California. First is San Onofre, this is down in Orange County. This is when you drive on PCH, just a little bit before you get to Pendleton, you see these, uh, these characteristic uh, dome structures on the right as you're going south. Uh, San Onofre uh, first went uh, in, uh, or first started operation in the late 60s, the first unit. Um, and then a couple decades later, two other units come online. Uh, uh, starting in 1997, we noticed that there's some of the, the water tubes, some essentially some of the internal workings of things uh, are starting to get dented, starting to get cracked, starting to get a lot of wear, um, primarily for, because of a high frequency vibrations and things of that nature, which the specifics don't matter. Just there's some parts that need that we're wearing out. We need to replace them. So um, starting in uh, uh, the next decade, so they started planning for it, said, okay, we're gonna need some replacement parts. They ordered the replacement parts, and then they started taking units offline to replace those parts. Took them offline, um, put them, uh, you know, back, uh, you know, re replaced the parts, um, started spinning them up, and started noticing problems. Um, and so this starts a series of investigations. Long story short, the federal regulators say there was a bad analysis done, a bad computer simulation as to what the stresses were gonna be on this, this internal part of the um, reactor. And that led to a bad design. And so they would have to completely redo all those parts of the uh, nuclear power plants if they wanted to keep operating them. And this caused a huge problem. So this was a delay. And then it's like the lawsuits about the, the engineering firm and you know, all this kind of stuff. Long story short, Southern California Edison, which is the entity that operates uh, Songs, San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, um, said that now because of that, the cost had soared an additional half a billion dollars. And they said, it just doesn't make sense for the amount of lifespan that we're gonna get out of these, it doesn't make sense. So in mid 2013, they announced the plant will close. And so they are now in the midst of, so there's no more nuclear gener nuclear power coming from songs and there never will be again. And we're in the process of decommissioning the plant. There are still lots of nuclear waste, lots of spent fuel rods and the like on site as with any nuclear power plant, but they are not, so we have all the downsides, all the potential danger of something spilling and getting released or whatever. We have, we have none of the upsides of power production going on at uh, songs and this is particularly problematic because we have our some of where we need our on-demand power in california southern california is summertime when everybody is super super hot days when it gets 100 plus degrees and everybody kicks on their air conditioner late in the day come home from work or whatever and so we're really hurting not having this on-demand generation when we need it um, and so our renewables are having to face a, a more uphill battle and um, our fossil fuel plants have, have um, been charged with meeting the peak demand for, for um, peak power supply. That's, in, that's a, a, a Orange County. If we go up to San Luis Obispo County, our only other, the only currently operating nuclear power plant in the state of California commercial is Diablo Canyon. This is in San Luis Obispo County in Avila Bay. If you guys sign up for Coastal, we'll go up there in the fall and we'll go, uh, we'll go visit Avila Bay as part of our tour of that part of California and looking at the coastal management in this area. Um, so this nuclear power plant starts also in the 60s. Um, initially in the early 60s, they announced they wanna put the plant on, on this massive dune complex um, and there's lots of environmental opposition to that. So then a couple of years later, they decide they're gonna to move to the current location, Diablo Canyon, uh, at the back of Avila Bay. Um, this, is, this is near Cal Poly, basically, um, our sister campus. Uh, and um, the Atomic Energy Commission approves the permit to start construction, et cetera, in the late 60s. Um, and so everything's going ahead. And then in the early 70s, there's the confirmation that there's a newly discovered earthquake fault just immediately offshore from the power plant. And 
So people are like, should we build it? So that causes delays and all kinds of stuff. And then they're just getting their, their feet, you know, their, their, their sea legs underneath them. They're like, okay, okay, we're getting ready to, to, to spin up and turn the sucker on. And then it's discovered the so-called mirror image thing where, where the, the builders, as they were installing the plant, they, they, the uh, part of the water system, part of the emergency fire, I think it was the fire retardant, was that what I can't remember? So, so, something about the emergency response. They flipped, the, they, they put the thing exactly backwards. So they didn't, didn't follow the plan. So that screwed everything up and they had to take all that stuff out and, and put them in the right way. So that slowed things down for another three years. So finally, in 1985, Unit 1 began generating uh, commercially available electricity and started working. I, I should say, begin commercial operation offline. I don't know what that is. I, I screwed up that. I shouldn't have said offline. It, commercial operation. Uh, 2000, there's a settlement over. And so in full disclosure, I sit on a board for the state looking at what's called once through cooling impacts. And so I, I, I have been involved in some way, shape, or form with some of these things here. Um, uh, I don't think that makes me biased, but just just for clarity and, and, and transparency. Um, <clears throat> so they settle for what the impacts are going to be. And uh, this plan is operated by Pacific Gas and Electric, the other <clears throat> uh, large utility that we most typically hear about in the context of wildfires. So they settle over the marine impacts of, of the, the effects of the operation of the uh, power plant. Um, and things are going, and then uh, 2016 happens. So 2016 happens, and um, uh, PG&E was getting ready to apply for an extension of the permit to the federal regulator, saying we want to operate this plant for another. I don't remember what they were, it was. It was under debate, but you know, they're 15 years or whatever it was uh, to continue operating, and shocked everybody. So environmental groups were, were lobbying to stop it and all this and that, and things were going. And it looked like uh, PG&E was probably going to, you know, maybe have to change some things here or there, but basically they were, they were, the general consensus was thinking that they would get their power plant renewed, uh, per permit, excuse me, for the power plant renewed, and they would keep going. Um, there were issues surrounding uh, 2011 with Fukushima, and, and it, it raised a lot of concerns about uh, again, a tsunami earthquake just offshore that looked like both San Onofre and Diablo Canyon. And so that caused a, more scrutiny, et cetera. But it seemed like PG&E was getting through that. And they just shocked everybody where on this one day in 2016, they just announced, uh, by the way, we're not, we're, we're pulling our application. We're not, we're not, it's not because of a lawsuit or whatever. We've just decided we've done the math. It's not worth us to uh, to keep going through the years and years of trying to fight and get this. And so we've just decided we're going to allow the, the um, operation to end when the current permits end. And so that's going to be in 2024 for one, gener for one unit and in 2025 for the other. And then it'll take several decades to fully decommission the, the, the plant. Um, and it'll cost something on the order of about $4 billion is the estimate to <clears throat> decommission the, the power plant. But that essentially come 2025, we will have no commercial uh, nuclear generation of power in California. Um, so uh, for all the concern about nuclear disasters, we, are, we, we still have nuclear waste around, we still have medical reactors and, and, the th and stuff of that nature. But as far as disasters from routine operations of things, um, we are moving away from that potential threat, um, which is unique. Most of the disasters we're talking about, earthquakes, are either just you know, continuing on or climbing wildfires, whatever, we're getting more and more. In this case, <clears throat> at least for the state of California, the risks from uh, a nuclear release, radiation release uh, are going down. So, um, so that's the story of us here in, um, um, California. And I would just, again, uh, when we look at all these examples, right? So uh, cracked, dented uh, pipes, things weren't working right. Have somebody design it, go put it in, didn't work right, right? The sensors in Three Mile Island, um, hey, this, this, this gauge reads something, oh my God, we've got to react and then find out that we were misreading the gauge, right? Um, putting in <clears throat> these different parts of the plant and then realizing we had them backwards. 
to locating the plant just offshore uh, or just onshore of an offshore fault, right? Again, the question of um, bug or feature. Is it a bug or feature? And so <clears throat> one of the issues that we're just seeing around the world, again, independent of all the concerns about radiation and nuclear waste and all that kind of stuff, is just the math, these, these things are so complex to work uh, safely and proficiently and effectively that th they are just a nightmare. They take years and years and years and years to, to get permitted and to, and, and the cost is just insane. So <clears throat> one of the trends that we're seeing is some people are arguing for much smaller, much more modular, smaller scale power plant. And we're seeing that across the electric grid, whereas the historic approach to generating electricity has been very industrial, very central planning, very centralized. You have a big giant coal fire plant, you have a big giant oil plant, you have a big giant dam. And that one big giant plant is going to send the powers over the you know hundreds and thousands, I mean, not thousands, but hundreds of miles down the power line to the city. Um, for a whole variety of reasons, because of efficiency and other things, um, the notion is maybe we shouldn't be designing our power plants that way. Maybe they should be much smaller, more modular, more distributed. And while that's going on across the um, power generation industry, um, it's also uh, part of the discussion for the next generation, potentially next generation of nuclear power plants. Um, but so far, we've not seen any of those tested in uh, at scale um, and and run under real world conditions. So for now, at least, uh, we don't seem like we're going to see. It doesn't seem like we're going to see much more um, electricity generated from nuclear power in the state of California. And and so just to wrap up, I would just say that um, safety is is a key thing here, right? And that, that the conversation always seems to come down to this. And that essentially the design of the system is key, but how humans interact with that system is also key. And how we deal with these um, uh, gray rhinos, right? These things that we don't know if they're going to happen exactly, but we suspect that some kind of earthquake might happen, some kind of tsunami might happen. We probably don't want to put the emergency generators on the first floor. In, 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 a, in a coastal setting where we might be inundated with tsunami surge uh, and things of that nature. So, so absolutely there's things that we might not figure out, but, but we are, uh, should all understand the risks um, about uh, nuclear, potentially uh, uh, nuclear meltdowns, release of radiation, and, and that should be um, no longer the, the termed a black swan, but it should be, I would posit to you guys that it should be maybe considered more of a of a gray rhino. Okay, and so I think that's most of what I wanted to say. We still have a couple of minutes for questions, but I think that's most of what I wanted to say. And so with that, I'll just pause and ask um, questions about any of that. Do you guys have any questions about uh, this last part or any of that part we've been talking about in terms of the, the disasters caused by the release of radi unintended release of radiation? Um, I had one question. Yeah, Caitlin. Um, since I'm not like super familiar with nuclear power plants and all that, how they really work. Um, how do you know when the, like the fuel rods are used up, like when mm -hmm. you can't use them anymore? Great question. So, um, uh, well, one, you can measure how much radiation is coming off of them, right? How radioactive they are. But in, in a sort of bigger picture, um, it, it's, uh, let's see. Uh, sort of in a planning stage, it's sort of like um, you know how many miles you know how many miles you're likely to get on your your tires, let's say in your car, or um, or for that matter, how much how far you can go with a, with a tank, tank of gas, right? And so so you have an indicator that you can check, but also just in general, you know, I can go 300 miles, you know, type of deal. And so <clears throat> what the power plants typically do is uh, they uh, because a, a, as they as the you know, they're, they're like any other radioactive substance. It, it doesn't go from full to empty, right? It, it goes and it gets less concentrated, less concentrated, less concentrated. And so there's two things there. One is there is, do we still have radiation in there? And of course you do. But really to, to operate um, optimally, 
you want to have them hot, what we call hot or 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 you know full of these radionuclides, right? And so so they will schedule the swapping out of fuel rods on a regular basis. Um, and so they don't just change a, it's not as if we change a fuel rod, oh, a number seven is bad. They change them in, uh, in mass kind of thing. And so it's typically on a schedule. So they know, just like, you know, if you're running your engine, you have an odometer or whatever that's tracking how much wear and tear you're having on your engine and you have your whatever 30,000 mile schedule where you change your fan belts and stuff like that. It's primarily on, on that sort of, uh, you know, scheduled, uh, um, swap out, but they can also directly measure if there were to be some question, if there was an earthquake or something was damaged or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, cool. Other questions. I've heard, um, at Diablo Canyon that there's like some different species in the water due to the warm water. Oh, totally. Oh, totally. Um, but I've never, no one's ever like really mentioned what kind of species those are. Do you? Yeah, know. good question. So, um, so the water coming, okay, so we're, so we're looking at the, di so that what we're looking at right here is the discharge uh, uh, bay. Um, and so uh, things have changed a little bit, I think since this photo was taken, but basically um, what we, so as you look here, it's, we see these, this little series of little alcoves and embayments, right? And so it's not just a, it's, it's not like, uh, point conception. It's not a point that's sticking out into the ocean and the currents are just whipping past. So there's relative protection here. So the water in these little protected embayments um, moves a little bit, uh, not quite as, as fast, right? And so um, uh, the water here is just slightly warmer. So for example, some of the things we get whenever we have an El Nino year, which is a warm water year. So we have uh, uh, warm waters from the south spilling up farther north than they the water would typically get. And so we see things that are more like around San Diego or Catalina Island can be brought up to this part of uh, California, you know, so hundreds of miles farther north. So you'll get things like um, angelfish, <clears throat> butterfly fish, stuff of that nature. Um, but we also, and so, and so those guys will come up and then, and then the currents will go back to normal. And so normally, Normally the currents, uh, the sort of the default current is moving, if we're looking at the picture in front of us here, it's moving from the left side of your screen along the coast to the right. And so normally it's bringing down cooler water from Northern California towards Los Angeles uh, in this photo or, or, or towards the, the right side of the um, coastline. And so um, you have the, these war warmer water species that come up and they sort of hang out and they settle. And then the, then all of a sudden go back to normal. And they're like, damn, it's cold up here. So they'll, they'll tend to concentrate in these pockets of warmer areas, most typically around power plants. Another classic example of something we see a lot of in this, this embayment would be leopard sharks. So leopard sharks, which uh, love it a little bit warmer, especially the females. We think what's going on is the females, um, the, the, the pups inside, they're, you know, they're, they're developing uh, inside mom. Um, so they they give birth to these sharks uh, so they don't lay an egg and go away. So they have the baby, the developing embryos inside of them. Um, uh, unlike things like horn sharks or, or swell sharks or things of that nature. And so, um, so it seems as if moms get some kind of benefit uh, for being in warmer water. Pre presumably they're, maybe their babies develop a few days earlier or a week or so faster or something like that. And so they might have a, a um, at an advantage in terms of other babies that are born a week or two later, maybe more food and stuff. And so we see large concentrations of leopard sharks in these areas. And then there's some other invertebrates and things like, um, what, like Kellett's whelk, you'll see more of that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff we see. Cool. Next question. I'll tell, I'll tell you one. If nobody has any other question, I'll tell you a, a story. But if somebody has a question, I want to answer your question. Okay, so I'll tell you a quick, a quick, so um, one of our uh, colleagues from Cal State Monterey Bay, um, who's an awesome uh, uh, coastal geographer mapper, um, led the effort to map a lot of the benthos around the state of California, California state waters that we use when we were generating the marine protected area uh, or doing the planning for our marine protected area network. Um, and, but he couldn't, 
but so we could map with taking a boat and using you know echolocators and and acoustic dopplers and things we could map the bottom of the ocean but we getting close to a place like this you couldn't do it because it gets so shallow that you, the boat couldn't go in so there's all this really wonderful habitat that we we're wondering what is the the benthos like what's the topography like very close into shore so he built a um a, um a wave runner so a little you know little uh sit on thing and and he um uh, he did build it on one of the sabbaticals. And so, so he would, he's, I had him down. We, we actually mapped a Magoo Lagoon one time. We mapped um, uh, Santa Clara Estuary uh, with it. And so he was telling me the story when, um, so Diablo Canyon contracted him and said, hey, we want, to, want you to map this area. And he said, okay. So he came on. And, and as you guys, maybe you've, well, I don't, think, I don't think you guys have taken my coastal management class, but maybe you'll take it in the fall. But uh, one of the things we learned about in that class is the fact that we all have coast, we all have access, right? The California Coastal Act guarantees us coastal access. All Californians can walk along the, the intertidal between high tide and low tide, regardless if there's a mansion there or not. The one exception are, nas are security things. So you can't do that on a military base and you can't do that in, in, in safe uh, and, and security exclusion zones. And, and a nuclear power plant is the perfect case where you're not just allowed to go walk on the beach there. And so he was contracted. So he put in his boat over, over a little bit farther away in Avila, Avila uh, Bay and, and was motoring around and was coming around. And so this thing is, yang, yang, you know, like a, a surf ski kind of thing, right? Yang, yang, super loud. So he has ear, uh, earmuffs, ear, ear, ear uh, protection on because it's so loud, right? And so he was sitting there and he came in and he was dodging in and out of this, where this photo was taken, dodging in and out of this thing, mapping the bottom, having a grand old time. And he's like, this is cool. Like, you know, how often you, you never get to come in here. So he's like by himself, like Woo -hoo! he's doing all this cool stuff. And um, didn't know what possessed him, but he took a look up at the cliff. So he was like around, he's around here and he looks up at the cliff and he sees all these, all these guys with rifles about to shoot him in the head. And he's like, what the hell? And he, and he, and he, he stops and saw so these like kind of special forces looking guys with like, you know, SWAT vests and black hats and stuff. And he's like, what the hell? So he stops and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He puts his hands up and he's like, what's going on? What's going on? And so apparently he called in to say that he was doing it, but it didn't get communicated to the security. And so they saw some weird guy buzzing back and forth with some like, weird weird thing with like a satellite on the back and so they thought he was some kind of terrorist so they were getting ready to uh to take him out um and so finally he uh he thankfully saw them and he did not get uh did not get blown away in the mapping of the benthos around diablo canyon but um there you go so that that's that's my uh, last story for the day and with that i think we're uh, we're 10 50 and so with that i think i'm going to uh kill it and i will have this up very soon